start? Yeah. Okay. All right, well, welcome. Thank you for coming out to the uh, first Waraza VT talk for the semester. We're pleased to have Dr. Charles Clancy as our first speaker of the semester. Uh, Dr. Clancy, of course, is the executive director of the Hume Center for National Security and Technology. He's also the Bradley Professor of Electrical and Computer Engineering. Uh, before he, and, of course, an internationally recognized expert in the intersection of wireless, cybersecurity, and artificial intelligence. Uh, before coming to Virginia Tech in 2010, wow, has it been that long term? Yeah. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Next year it's going to be 10 years. I don't know. I think that's wow. statute of limitations or something. Like that. <laughs> before he came here, he was a researcher at the National Security Agency, and uh, he received a BS in computer engineering from Rose Holman. His master's in electrical engineering from the University of Illinois, and his PhD in computer science from the University of Maryland. Uh, he's currently a senior member of the IEEE and has over 200 peer reviewed technical publications and patents, co author of five books, and the co founder of four venture backed startup companies. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Mike. Join me in welcoming Dr. Charles Clancy. All right. Um, so today I'm going to be talking a bit about security and privacy for 5G. Uh, 5G is the subject of a lot of hype right now. Um, my favorite was, uh, uh, it was like, what, two weeks ago where AT&T pushed an update to their phones that had 4G a logo changed to a 5GE logo. Not that 5GE actually means anything. Uh, but they're trying to get above, ahead of the marketing curve. Um, and then uh, Timo had a, 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 a something that they posted on Twitter that included someone taking a Timo phone and taking a little tiny post-it note and putting it over top of the Timo 4G icon that said 9G um, as a jab at AT&T. Um, but uh, as, as, as any new generation of cellular technology comes along, there's always uh, some excitement around people trying to make the last generation look uh, enough like the new one to be able to get ahead of the marketing. But um, 5G is actually starting to turn into something real. Um, the standards now are sufficiently filled in that people kind of know what it's going to be. Um, over the last year, uh, the release of 3GPP that came out in March of last year really began filling in a lot of some of the... Uh, uh, the, the, the security around the radio access network and how all well that was going to work. Um, and then the release that came out in September provided a lot more detail around how the security was, was going to work in the core network. Um, and so primarily focused here on, on security and privacy in, in the core network, uh, although I do have some stuff about uh, sort of the, the security on the edge network as well. So um, in terms of what's really happening in, in 5G, uh, you have 5G new radio, NR. That's the standard for the specification between the cell tower and your phone. Uh, the standard behind that's pretty much done. Exciting new things that are, that are in the standard for that. Uh, millimeter wave bands, uh, massive multi-user MIMO, uh, spectrum sharing, uh, carrier aggregation. These are all things that sort of started in 4G and are now really maturing in 5G. Um, but of course, the goal is to be able to get an 100x through or faster throughput to your phone. So, Instead of LTE, which is going to give you speeds of, of 10 megabits per second uh, in a peak scenario, again, the goal is to get gigabit per second speeds to your phone in peak scenarios with 5G. Um, the security, though, and privacy are um, not, not radically different than 4G. Uh, I'll talk specifically about some of the changes. Uh, but then if you look behind the, uh, the base station, uh, in, in 5G they're called G-node Bs. I have run out of ways to name these things. You had, uh, in, in 3G, you had node Bs, uh, or NBs. In 4G, they became enhanced node Bs, or E node Bs. And in 5G, they decided to call them G node Bs because I think somebody at Ericsson thought it sounded good. The G doesn't actually mean anything. So anyway. Um, then if you look behind the, uh, the, the, the base station, then you have all the core network components. So, I've sort of broken it down into sort of three broad things uh, to talk about from a security perspective. One is uh, the 5G core, 5GC is the acronym for that. Uh, the 5GC uh, control plane. So this is the uh, everything that's behind the base station that is responsible for knowing what tower the phone is connected to, so it can route data and phone calls to it. Um, 
uh, knowing which subscriber is which so that they can appropriately bill the right accounts. Uh, it's all the stuff that sits behind the, the network that really makes it work. Um, there is a, uh, uh, and, and the interesting thing that's happening right now is, uh, for those of you that have had Dr. Reed's cellular class, uh, will know the, the, that historically a lot of the cellular standards had a very block diagram uh, uh, oriented core network. So you had a, like in, in 4G, you have the MME, and the MME is sort of the brains of the, of the network. And you have um, the different gateways that do very specific things, and they're all connected together with very specific interfaces. And so if you were to buy a, a core network, uh, you'd have a rack of equipment, and each of the, each of the things in that rack would, would be responsible for one very specific function in the network. And they'd have cables between them that match the cable that you see in a diagram that's been drawn out that is the architecture for the network. Um, 5G basically says that's how the internet used to work. Now everything's in the cloud, so there shouldn't be boxes of anything anywhere. Um, essentially, everything in the 5G uh, control plane is now a cloud service that sits somewhere in some cloud and is able to talk to other cloud services sitting in some other cloud or in the same cloud. So everything becomes cloudified, if you will, in the 5G core as far as how it's actually operating. Another interesting thing they've done is they've really embraced public key cryptography, which is a whole security framework for the control plane. Uh, the previous generations actually had zero security in the control plane. Now, um, now 5G has introduced a whole layer of security to the control plane that was never there before. Kind of moving up the stack here, you have network slicing. So this gets into the concepts of software-defined networking and network function virtualization. It's the idea that uh, I can create any kind of network I want. Again, if I embrace the future of the world as everything is a virtual machine, uh, then Switches and routers can be virtual machines. Uh, base stations can be virtual machines. Anything can be a virtual machine. If anything can be a virtual machine, including the network infrastructure itself, then I can uh, sort of arbitrarily create any network I want based on the immediate conditions that I see. So for example, if, uh, if I have networking equipment that is near a stadium, for example, um, and that stadium is going to have a large sporting event with, I don't know, 10,000 people show up, and I need to be able to deliver broadband service to 10,000 people in an area. Um, I can reprovision spectrum and move it from one tower to another. I can uh, add a whole bunch more virtual base stations in a particular area that are providing much wider bandwidth service. I can stand up all new control plane infrastructure that's going to be able to uh, deal with the, with the control plane volume that's going to come from all those subscribers. Um, I can stand up new firewalls and new routers and new switches, all virtually, that can uh, be designed to specifically support that environment. Uh, but it, it embraces this future world where everything is just the cloud. Uh, and then if I go up even further, edge computing, um, historically, the, the cellular network is really just a way to get bits from your phone to the cloud. That's kind of how 4G operates right now. Uh, and the future is, well, if everything's the cloud, then why can't I take computation that would ordinarily happen across the country and move that cloud workload to be on the same server that is running the base station or the control plane, right? That means much lower latencies between my phone and the services that I'm accessing on the network. And those much lower latencies mean that I can do things that I couldn't do before. So for example, if you look at um, uh, vehicle to vehicle communication, if I slam on my brakes and my car is going to send out a signal that needs to alert the car behind me that, uh, that the person in front of them is slamming on their brakes, um, that signal needs to be very fast. It can't wait for the latency of going all the way through the cloud, getting processed by some server across the country, and then coming all the way back and then being sent to the car right next to me. The latency associated with that is, I don't know, 200 milliseconds uh, in some cases. And if you are about to be in an accident, you don't have 200 milliseconds to spare. Uh, but the idea with 5G and with, uh, with edge computing is I can take the, f the cloud function that's responsible for relaying the slam on the brake signal, and instead of that running in the cloud halfway across the country, I can move that, that code and actually have it live in the same, the same blade server that's responsible for all the stuff that's uh, local to me. Um, so again, this idea of edge computing. Everything's virtual, and whether it's my computational, uh, the, the, the computational load that I have or the computational services that I need, or it's the fundamental components to synthesize the network itself. Everything becomes a, a, a virtualized in this very new virtual cloud that, that will somehow come into existence. Um, so 5G is just this, the core networking of 5G is, is this 
complete reimagining of the internet, in my opinion. Right now, the internet's sort of designed around data centers with, with server infrastructure in them that execute cloud functions, and there's the network plumbing that moves the data to where it needs to get to, and then you have the wireless networks, either in people's homes or uh, cellular networks that are outside that are responsible for getting you access to that network. And uh, as you start thinking through what the impacts of 5G are going to be, it, it completely changes that entire architecture. And, and really, and that's one of the reasons they call it fog computing, because it's really yeah, the, it's the edge of the cloud. Everything is, is sort of everywhere. And I can dynamically create a network. I can dynamically create a cloud service. So I can dynamically provision it and rewire it and reconfigure it uh, to meet whatever the needs are of my particular application. And um, so that's kind of the exciting part. Now, from a security perspective, that's both good and bad. So it's good because now if I have a, a network and it comes under significant attack from the outside, I can rewire how it connects to the rest of the internet on the fly. I can dynamically put a firewall in the network somewhere where it never was in order to block certain types of traffic that might be affecting me. Um, I can uh, change my topology. So if an adversary has somehow learned my topolo the topology of my network and is using that to try and attack me, I can change the topology of my network uh, on the fly. Um, so that's all great. There's a lot of cybersecurity problems of today that this kind of networking can change uh, and enable solutions for. The flip side of that is this is really complicated and is going to completely rewire the DNA of the internet and we're going to screw it up. And there's going to be massive cybersecurity vulnerabilities in all of what we deploy over the next 10 years. And uh, we need to put a lot of thought into how we design these protocols, how we design these systems, so that we don't create an internet that is infinitely exploitable. Uh, we don't have a situation where an adversary can take a, 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 a virtual machine that has snooping code on it and virtually deploy it into my network without me even knowing it so that they're able to spy on all the traffic that's going back and forth. Right? Those things are possible in an environment where everything is a virtual machine and I can rewire the entire network uh, however I want. So um, that's, again, both the challenge and the opportunity. So as, as I look at uh, how we, we need to develop the, the security for 5G, we need to think through how all these control plane interfaces are going to work, how they're authenticated, how transactions are authorized, um, and do so in a way that will uh, um, uh, enable some of these products to be deployed in a way that are actually secure. Um, another thing that's really, really important is this, this PKI right here. So uh, historically, cell phones have used SIM cards. SIM cards have an encryption key on them. There's a matching encryption key in the cellular network. And when you connect to the cell tower, you prove both networks prove that they know the same key, and then that derives session keys, and those session keys are used to encrypt your traffic. Um, but the big problem is that, well, no, so, so the, the, there's some scalability challenges with that, and, and so 5G is saying, well, why don't we open the door to not only using symmetric key cryptography, which we've used in cellular networks for the last 30 years, and also begin to allow using PKI, or public key infrastructure. That's where I have one key, and the network has a different key. Um, which is great. There's a whole bunch of new applications that are opened up by doing something like this, and you actually can add a whole lot of security to the control plane you could never have before. So it's fundamentally required if you actually want to build all this and have it even remotely be secure. The challenge is that, uh, that quantum is heating up every day. There's some new article about some quantum computer that's getting faster, has more qubit bits and more capability. And if you look at the projections, we're about 10 years out from quantum computers being able to destroy all encryption on the internet. And that's bad. Um, so if we're going to build an entire new DNA of the internet and we're going to base it on encryption that has a 10-year lifespan before quantum computers are able to break it all, that's bad. So um, there's uh, entirely new quantum resistant algorithms that are being talked about and thought about, but certainly not standardized or built or deployed yet. And one of the areas I think that is important is to begin thinking about that so that we don't build an internet that is even more vulnerable 10 years from now when uh, quantum uh, breaks all of the uh, encryption that we know today. Pause there and see if there's, uh, yes? In, in the event that quantum computing does do that, which I want to think it will happen at some point, um, what's going to happen to total anarchy on the internet? <laughs> Potentially. So uh, I actually put a lot of thought into this about two years ago because a writer for HBO approached me because he planned to write a series for HBO based on that premise. Yeah. Um, and so <laughs> uh, basically, yeah, that, there's, there's, there, there's going to be a lot of that. Um, now, 
Yes. Uh, no, so what, what you see right now is that every, um, uh, every five or so years, we increase the key length. So it used to be websites had 512-bit keys on them. Then they upgraded to 1024-bit keys. Now the best practice is 2048-bit keys. The next step beyond that would be uh, 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 81, 92-bit keys, right? So we can keep making our RSA keys longer and longer, but that adds a lot of inefficiency. It adds a lot of overhead every time you connect to a secure website. Um, and uh, so that's, that, that's not good. It's also not scale. Again, if, if quantum computing hits a, hits a, a knee a, a, of, of growth, then they may be able to outpace our ability to deploy longer and longer key sizes. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, it would, it would be essentially if, if we just didn't use encryption at all. It's, and that's really how the internet worked about 10 years ago. There was very little encrypted traffic on the internet, except for like logging into your bank's website. There was very little security and that had its own challenges. So um, certainly governments could use it to significant nefarious effect, uh, as could hacker groups uh, among others. So any other questions before I jump into the next section? Okay, so let's get into a little bit more detail in terms of uh, um, the, uh, the different use cases and sort of what this means from a credential perspective. So uh, the EU is way ahead of us on all of this. And so in 2013, they established a group uh, that was responsible for trying to envision what 5G needed to be, help develop the requirements for it, help map that to potential technologies that would be used as part of it. Um, and there's a group called 5G Insure, which was a subset of a larger group called the uh, 5G uh, public-private partnership uh, that specifically looked at security for 5G. And so they put together different scenarios of, of, of how identity and authentication should work in 5G. So just to give you some motivating examples. So one, you might have a device in a factory uh, that needs to connect to a uh, 5G access point that is in the factory. In, the, in Europe right now, they have this whole thing called Industry 4.0, and the idea is to completely change how manufacturing uh, works by using wireless to connect together robots on an assembly line with uh, all the different advanced capabilities for advanced manufacturing. Um, and it, again, the idea is to really kind of transform the, the whole manufacturing space, uh, leveraging wireless and other technologies. Um, so you can imagine robots on a factory floor that are um, connecting to a 5G access point can need very high data rate, very low latency communications in order to be uh, precisely controlled for whatever whatever task they're doing. Um, and in these scenarios, uh, they're really not even they're not touching a um, uh, 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 a they're, they're using a private 5G network, right? So the 5G network needs the ability to uh, authenticate using an enterprise credential. So um, uh, an enterprise credential. So for, for most most people in this room have have uh, both a, a, an enterprise credential and a, and a, a global credential. So in your SIM card, you have a, uh, in your phone, you have a SIM card. That's kind of your global credential that gives you access to the internet wherever you are. But you also have your Virginia Tech username and password that you use to connect to um, EduRoam, right? That's an enterprise credential that works here on campus because it's part of a, an enterprise network. So that's the difference. So you can imagine factories or hospitals or lots of other places deploying private LTE networks that would use your your hokey login to, uh, to access the network. Um, there's also scenarios where you might be connected to EduRoam uh, and then you drive off campus and you want to automatically connect to Verizon or AT&T's 5G network. And you want to be able to use the same username and password to authenticate to both networks. So that's another scenario that's envisioned where you're able to go back and forth between uh, enterprise networks and, and public networks using the same credential. Uh, and there's a lot of questions around the business uh, side of that. So if you're logging into Verizon using your, your Virginia Tech ID, who's paying for that service? Uh, ultimately, Verizon then needs to bill Virginia Tech for your access. So there's a, none of the business processes for any, how any of that would work really have been sorted out yet. But that's the sort of things that are envisioned. Um, another is satellite connectivity. So 5G envisions not only things like millimeter wave and, and other advanced modes of terrestrial communication, but there's a whole SATCOM component that's part of 5G as well. Companies like SpaceX and OneWeb are planning to launch 10,000 satellites into low Earth orbit to provide gl ubiquitous global internet access. 
So uh, a lot of the, the, the methodologies that are being considered there are, are leveraging 5G with a SATCOM mode associated with it. So again, being able to use enterprise or, or uh, network credentials to access 5G services. Um, and then, then the, the last one is MNO Identity Management Service. So this is a scenario where, um, let's say uh, you go to your bank website um, well, maybe bank, banks, but yeah, well, let's say, uh, I'm trying to think where I've used this before. Let's say you go to Grubhub and you want to order some food for delivery. You can either log in with your Grubhub a username and password that you create and whatever, or there's a button there that says log in with Facebook or log in with Google, right? So that's a scenario where Facebook or Google is essentially the identity provider and they're using your identity to log you into a third party service, i.e. Grubhub. And then Grubhub is able to access your, your name, your address, your phone number, your credit card information. Um, and so that's where you have a third party that's providing identity uh, to, to another service. Uh, there's this vision that instead of using Google or Facebook as the identity provider, uh, instead you'd actually use Verizon or AT&T. So you'd go to Grubhub website and instead of asking you to log in, it would, be able, it would, it would ask permission to essentially log you in using your SIM card or whatever credential you had that connected you to your network. And then in that way, um, you have a, a perhaps a firmer identity. In fact, I was just talking back and forth with, uh, with a guy from the FCC this morning, um, very concerned about burner phones and the fact that there's no good accountability for a burner phone. You can get a burner phone without showing any form of identification. And it's really interesting as you think about cell phone companies trying to make prepaid or sorry, postpaid accounts a form of identity, right? Do you actually, do you need to like, is getting a cell phone SIM card as, as complicated and rigorous as getting a driver's license? Uh, if that really is a, a real source of identity, could you log into the IRS website using your cell phone account? These are the sorts of things that could be possible as you begin looking at, at some of the use cases that are envisioned for 5G for authentication and identity. There was a study done by the White House uh, like four years ago where they looked across the entire US population and tried to find the the best source of identity. Like imagine if you wanted to, again, log into the IRS website and pull up former tax returns. What is the best digital identity, the most rigorously vetted digital identity for you out there that exists? And the White House study concluded that Facebook is the best digital identity that we have right now. And um, again, I, <laughs> that's probably not a good position. If, you, if you're a government and you want to deliver e-services to your citizens, Relying on Facebook accounts as the way to uh, uh, determine your identity is probably not the best method. So there's a gap there in digital identity that if we want to vote online or pay taxes online or whatever we are going to do online one day, there needs to be a better way to link that to a real a credible identity. And, and so cellular operators are trying to figure out how they could become that source of identity. Um, so in order to accomplish that, they're opening up the different ways that you can authenticate to a 5G network. Right now, there's a, a protocol called AKA. Uh, authenticated key something um, that is a key agreement, excuse me, authenticated key agreement that is a cryptographic protocol that your SIM card enters into with a network when you first connect to a network. Um, and uh, the plan is to extend that and support other approaches as well. So there's some extensions to it right now that are going through the process. Um, in fact, the current AKA uh, algorithm has a, has a vulnerability in it because it's using a hash function that's been hacked since it was designed, and so there's uh, some extensions that are trying to address that. Uh, but you could also use any other uh, authentication method to log in. You could use a public key certificate. Uh, you could use a username and password. Um, you could use a Duo Mobile, two-factor, whatever. All of these sorts of things are possible uh, now under the, the, the modes that are enabled in, in 5G. Um, and then, uh, so, if, so that was what was part of the original uh, visioning for all this. If you look at what's currently in release 15, which is the current release of the 3GPP standards, um, they don't support all of these wacky ideas. Um, they currently support authenticating to the 5G core network uh, through the 5G uh, radio network um, using basically your SIM card, uh, which would be the very standard mode that you would expect. Um, you can also authenticate to the 5G core through a Wi-Fi access point, for example. Um, using uh, your SIM card as well. Uh, a lot of that's for hotspots where they're trying to, to do data offloading. So um, uh, basically, again, tracing back in history, when, um, when, when AT&T signed the deal with the iPhone in 2007 to be the like, 
provider of, of the first real smartphone to the world, or to the US anyway. Um, uh, the, the, the traffic generated by the iPhone completely crippled the AT&T network. And one of the ways they sought to address that was through Wi-Fi hotspots. And so they made deals with Starbucks and others to try and, and get access to those hotspots when you were there. Um, there was a lot of security problems that showed up as a result because iPhones were just connecting to any Wi-Fi hotspot that seemed to give them internet access, which again uh, is, is, is bad. Um, and so there's this whole approach where actually you now can legitimately authenticate to a real Wi-Fi access network uh, using your SIM card and you know that you're talking to a legitimate service. Um, there's also the ability to authenticate to external networks uh, via the 5G core, so using your SIM card to authenticate to third-party services. Um, and then uh, there are scenarios that are kind of targeting um, either private networks or IoT networks. Uh, these are, are informative at this point. So it was part of the vision that was presented earlier, but currently not, um, not part of the standards. So then we get into the actual security. So um, after you authenticate to a network and the network knows who you are, then you need to encrypt your traffic between yourself and the, and the, and the tower and the network. Um, there's kind of two broad segments. There's the control signaling, known as the non-access stratum, or, or an NAS. Uh, and then there's the, the actual plane of the network that conveys your data, the, the data that your phone is generating and sending to the internet and, and, and getting back again. Uh, that's known as the access stratum. The, the data plane of the network. And so in, in 4G, there was a lot of this optional. The only thing that was required was that you had to uh, apply integrity protection to your control signaling between yourself and the network. And in fact, you were not allowed to put any integrity protection on data traffic going to the internet. Part of that was for efficiency reasons. They sort of thought it was redundant. And um, there was a, a, group of ha a group of researchers who hacked this Know, maybe three or four months ago, maybe it was a little bit longer ago, but they showed that with a very cleverly designed um, uh, uh, man-in-the-middle attack, you could use the fact that there was no uh, integrity protection to uh, actually launch a cyber attack against someone's phone. So things like this are now being fixed in 5G. More of them are required. Uh, there's this new thing called Optional Plus, which is basically, unless you live in a country that uh, does not allow encryption, uh, then um, uh, you need to use it. And all the US carriers intend to deploy um, all of the, the, the needed encryption here. There's a couple other things that were added into the standard. Um, one is called SUPI encryption. Um, so a, a SUPI is the unique identifier on a SIM card in 5G. So here in the US over the last probably three years, four years, there's been this whole anxiety around things called um, IMSI catchers. So an IMSI catcher is a, basically a fake cell tower. Um, it transmits a, a legitimate cell signal, but it's not really part of the actual cellular network. And um, the signal that it transmits is specifically designed to lure phones into connecting to it. And once the phone connects to it, it actually can't talk to the phone because it doesn't have the needed encryption keys. But what it can do is ask the phone to tell it its identity. And the phone will tell it its unique identity, and then the, the IMSI catcher will, will disconnect from the phone, and the phone will go back to the real network. Um, so this, is, this sort of technology was developed by the military to try and understand, all right, well, uh, there's somebody we're looking for that has this IMSI, or the IMSI is the, um, the unique ID on your SIM card. We know the IMSI. Um, we want to find this person, or we want to know if this person comes by a particular area. Um, and so they would use the, these things called IMSI catchers to, um, uh, to be able to basically do surveillance on cell phones, to determine if, if a cell phone owned by a particular target was in the, in the region. Um, as U.S. troop uh, activity in the Middle East drew down, a lot of this technology found its way into um, U.S. Uh, uh, sort of um, uh, 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 law enforcement ecosystems. So my favorite uh, example of this is the Annapolis Police Department in Maryland uh, apparently has one of these things. And um, through FOIA requests, a group found out how they had been using it. And the most preposterous thing the Annapolis Police Department ever used this thing for was uh, to track down someone who had stolen uh, $50 worth of chicken wings from a pizza hut. <laughs> So we're using military-grade technology that's designed to try and track terrorists 
to track down uh, chicken wing thieves uh, at this point domestically. This, there was an, so that was one sort of set of things that happened. Meanwhile, this group a couple years ago went around Washington, D.C. with a device that was specifically designed to, to find these fake space stations. And um, they found a lot. Uh, they found a whole bunch around the White House. They found a whole bunch up and down uh, Massachusetts Avenue where all the embassies are. They found a bunch around the Pentagon. And uh, they just published a, a, I think there was a Wall Street, I'm sorry, Washington Post article on, on, on their findings, um, which caused Congress to sort of spin up. And Congress asked uh, FCC and DHS to do an analysis of this. Um, DHS said that, yeah, we think they might be there, but our equipment's not very good, and sent that as a report back to Congress. And Congress said, okay, well, FBI, what are you going to do about it? FBI says, oh, well, the FBI and the FCC, they, their equipment's no good, and the things they think are there really aren't there. And then, anyway, it, so it got very complicated. And then the fact that, um, uh, that, that our president does not use a secure encrypted cell phone also came into the debate because he is using a standard Android cell phone where people have discovered a bunch of cell phone surveillance technology, um, or allegedly. So um, uh, this, this topic heated up significantly and put pressure on the standards bodies to encrypt the identities. This wouldn't happen anymore in 5G. Yep. So you said these were like rogue surveillance networks? Yes. I actually had the pleasure of testifying on Capitol Hill this past summer on this topic um, and uh, got to answer questions from, from congressmen on, uh, on whether or not this was a threat and what to do about it. Uh, and the problem is that there's a lot of things you could do to solve it, um, but then that affects law enforcement operations as well. And so, yeah, we can stop, but we may be able, we may be able to stop foreign governments from being able to do this to us, but then we also stop our own law enforcement from doing this for legitimate applications. So. Uh, it's kind of a lose-lose situation with no good option, but all the pressure resulted in 5G closing the gap and adding encryption to the identity so that this wouldn't happen anymore. Of course, it only solves the problem for 5G, and I know if, if you get a 5G phone, your phone's still going to support 4G and still going to support 3G and still support 2G, and so uh, I don't have to have a 5G, uh, I don't have to do, use 5G to, to do this, I can use 4G to do this because your phone still talks 4G. So. Um, Okay, so let's, and is there a clock? No? Oh, over there. All right, okay, I got 25 minutes. So let's look at, at actually what the 5G core network looks like. Um, none of the words in these boxes really matter. Um, <laughs> the important thing is that, uh, is that, okay, so here you've got the phone, here you have the, access, the, the base station, and then uh, behind the base station, you got all this other stuff. Um, and these boxes each do different things. They manage different control functions of the network. They do uh, session management. There's authentication right there, network functions, and all that other stuff. Um, in 4G, all of these boxes would be physically servers in a rack that would be each doing their one function. But in 5G, you'll note that everything connects to this common common wire here. And this is essentially a software bus because each one of these things is a microservice that's running in the cloud. And they're all communicating with each other over this sort of shared uh, communications bus. And each one of them is basically just a piece of code. And that piece of code can be spun up, it can be spun down. If you have a surge of activity in a particular area, you can set up a whole second core network and spin it all up because it's all virtual machines. Um, it's all microservices that can be elastically deployed depending on what the, what the load is. It can be migrated from one server to another depending on uh, performance and load balancing and all kinds of other things. Um, so that's the fundamental shift that we see within the network. The challenge, though, is that every single one of these boxes in, 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 in 4G, you could pretty much trust every single interface because I have a piece of equipment in a rack that does function X. I have a piece of equipment in the, in the rack that does function Y. There's an Ethernet cable that hooks them together. And the chance that some foreign third party is able to uh, uh, somehow tap into that cable that's only this long uh, and be able to influence things and be able to inject false data is very low because there's physically a cable that represents that link. But now in 5G, it's not a physically a cable that represents any of this. Now it's a, a software bus that's providing connectivity between a bunch of cloud services. 
which means that you no longer can make this assumption that everything is trusted in the core network. And once you eliminate that assumption, you now have to have every single one of these boxes has to have its, un its own unique uh, authentication credential, typically an encryption key. Um, and it has to have the ability to uh, connect in a secure way, in an authenticated way, and in an authorized way to every other box uh, in, this, in this network. Um, and that's uh, one of the fundamental changes that we see in the 5G control plane that's driving, again, a, a shift in, in what it means for security. Um, this is just an example. So the, the important thing is, is that each one of these little lines between everything, this is uh, it's, it's web services. So essentially the same protocol that your phone uses to, to download a web page off, off of a website is the same, essentially the protocol and language that's being used for um, all these boxes to talk to each other, all these services to talk to each other. It's a, a get and a post and a, and a um, uh, yeah, basically a get and post are the two um, uh, methods. You can either get data from someone or you can post new data to something and each one is its own little database with its own logic functions and um, it's, again, it's, it's a web API for those that have done any uh, sort of web API programming. Um, so then, okay, how, how would we encrypt and secure all of these things? Well, if it's essentially all web services, uh, then we can use all of the security functions that have already been developed to secure the World Wide Web. Um, and so essentially what's, what they've done is they've defined this model where you have two different security domains. This could be Verizon and this could be AT&T, for example. Right? So in Verizon's network, they have these network elements, or NEs, that are all talking to each other. And there's some sort of uh, a security gateway. That's what SEG stands for right here. And then on, on the other carrier's network, they have all their components, and they have their own security gateway. And what's defined in the standards is that these guys all can, um, can communicate with each other. Uh, these guys can communicate with each other. These guys can communicate with each other. But this guy and this guy cannot directly communicate with each other. They have to go through the security gateways. And the security gateways are able to uh, enforce all kinds of additional um, uh, uh, security and, and uh, security services. Um, if you look at what the requirements are um, at the network level, um, IPsec, which is the, the sort of IP layer, uh, virtual private networking encryption technology, IPsec is optional. <laughs> Uh, if it's happening within the same security boundary, but if it's going across security boundaries, i.e. right here, then you have to use IPsec to encrypt and authenticate your, your, your network layer. Uh, if you go up a layer, um, a TLS, so again, if, if you go to a website and the website is a secure website, it has a little lock icon in the corner and it says HTTPS instead of HTTP, uh, then that means you're using transport layer security, that's encrypting the connection between your computer and the, the site that you're talking to. Um, essentially, that same exact standard is, is required for everything that's crossing a security boundary, but it's optional for anything inside a, a security boundary. And then at the end, there's also this application security. So um, just because this guy and this guy can identify each other, it doesn't mean that this guy is allowed to make a particular request of this guy. And so there's this whole authorization layer that is, is part of the standards as well. I'll talk a little bit more because it's kind of wonky um, how all that works. There is this like little footnote in the standard that says, okay, all this stuff is optional, but uh, you gotta use something. And if, uh, if you wanna not encrypt anything, then you have to basically state that physical security is providing the security, i.e. all this stuff is in a single computer or in a single rack of computers and it's locked and nobody can get, get access to any of the interfaces. Um, but uh, I have, I did a study for the US cellular industry here and, and what they should do. And, um, my recommendation to them was that, that this should be required for uh, any of the U.S. deployments just because it would enable um, additional security at the higher layers. We'll see if they actually do that. Um, so I talked a little bit about AT&T and Verizon and how they might interface with each other. The previous slide showed an abstract view. Um, this is a much more concrete view. So here's the, here's the wiring diagram you saw two slides ago. And in 5G, there's this thing called the Security Edge Protection Proxy. Security Edge Protection Proxy is, is that security gateway. And this is the interface between any two networks. And this is the point where you can do all kinds of interesting policy enforcement and security. 
Um, although it's still a pretty wide open research field of how you might design the security policy that would go into those things, what sort of data should be allowed to trans transit and what that don't necessarily need to be transiting it, um, how might you build a firewall or an intrusion detection system uh, that would be able to detect threats that are coming in over the control plane. Um, in order to kind of give you a concrete example, um, about three years ago, uh, there was a big study published where um, basically what happened is a hacker group had gotten into a, um, a, a, a cellular provider in, uh, I believe, some African country. Was not well secured, got in, was able to get into their core network, and in doing so, was, was able to synthesize um, requests through the global roaming network, right? You've got um, about 70% of all of the, the wireless networks uh, in the world are interconnected through these roaming agreements. And so if you can hack into any one of them, you can then be able to push requests into this global roaming network that connects everybody together. Um, and through that network, what they did was they showed that they could push a command in that would say, here is someone's phone number. Um, tell me the, uh, the unique identifier on their SIM card or their IMZ. And that command would get pushed in, would get routed through the global roaming network, would land at Verizon's network. Verizon's system would dutifully do the lookup as requested and send the response back to the person who made the request. Then what they did was they should, could say, all right, well, uh, now that I know the IMSI, can you tell me what tower the IMSI is currently connected to? And if you don't know, can you page the phone and find it for me? And so they would send this request through the network. The network would dutifully do the paging request, identify the location of the phone, and send it back to the, to, to, to the, 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 the person. And so the person who did all this created a website, actually, where you could type in anyone's phone number, and it would then give you the latitude and longitude of the tower they were connected to of any subscriber anywhere in the world. And this was a problem. <laughs> um, so again, this put pressure on the 5G standards to maybe fix this. Uh, so that's why they have these security edge protection proxies where you can have authentication and authorization and be able to institute a lot of policy enforcement to know is some random internet service provider across the country, uh, like, okay, I'm Verizon, I have a Verizon subscriber that's connected to my network in, I don't know, Milwaukee, and I suddenly start getting requests from uh, an internet service provider in Prague uh, wanting to know the location of this phone, maybe that's not a response I should, a, a, a query I should respond to, or maybe something I should flag. So that kind of logic is now possible because of the, uh, uh, the these gateways. Um, and there's a bunch of stuff about uh, the different protocols that they use. There's some, some unique functions that they provide. Um, they're based on, uh, on HTTP2 over TCP. Um, there's this new standard that's working its way through the, the standardization process called QUIC, which is this really kind of uh, pared back, uh, bare bones version of, uh, of HTTP that's designed for um, very low latency communications. And so there's a, a proposal that maybe the 5G system could move over to using that for the control plane signaling, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's not sort of, the standard's not done yet. Um, other things, there's this whole idea of topology hiding. Um, AT&T shouldn't be able to see inside the, 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 the Verizon network and vice versa. All you should be able to see is that gateway that's sitting on the outside. So, um, so then they went even more overboard uh, with some crazy stuff that I, I can't wait to see how this gets implemented because this is the kind of thing that like uh, an engineer dreams up as the most elegant solution, but someone who has to implement it just starts hitting their head against the wall because it's super complicated. Um, but uh, this is what's known as, as token-based security. And so in a real roaming network, um, it's not like Verizon doesn't have a roaming relationship with all 180 cell phone networks that exist in the world. They have a roaming relationship with what's known as an aggregator. Uh, a company like Cineverse is a, is a company that does aggregation and they are a roaming broker. So Cineverse has roaming relationships with 100 different cellular carriers, and then they act as a middleman to, to, to enable one cellular carrier to talk to another cellular carrier and, and have the roaming relationship go through. Everybody has standardized contracts and standardized rates, and that allows uh, you to roam globally without your carrier having to have a relationship with every single cell phone company in the world. So because of that, there's this acknowledgment that, all right, I've got a security edge protection proxy on one network. I've got a security edge protection proxy on another network. 
but they don't actually have a direct link to each other. There could be these uh, these uh, things called IXP. I, I'm sorry, IPX is in the middle, uh, which is uh, uh, something something exchange. Uh, but they're these aggregators, um, and so the idea here is that aggregators don't just pass messages without changing them. Because they're actually routing the messages from point A to point B, they sometimes have to make changes to the messages in route in order to get it to go to the right spot. Uh, there might be business logic rules that have to be applied as part of, of it, it being routed through the global uh, backplane of, of the roaming networks. And so we had, there had to be this acknowledgement that these intermediaries need the ability to change the messages in flight, but that's also a security risk. If, Aggregators have the ability to arbitrarily change messages. The whole point is to add encryption and authentication so people can't tamper with the messages. So how do you reconcile these two things? So they came up with a somewhat clever process where essentially what happens is this guy will generate uh, an encrypted authenticate, well, an authenticated message saying, this is the command that I want to execute across the global roaming network. Um, I'm sorry, this is, it's going this way. Um, so uh, this guy is, is going to send this, this message this guy is uh, going to receive it, but needs to make a change to it. So what he does is he generates what's known as a JSON uh, patch modification. So what he does is he says, these are the things I need to change about this message. Uh, I need to change this field to this field. I need to change this field to this field. This is my ID, and I'm going to digitally certify that, that I'm the one who made this change. And so instead of actually changing the original message, what he does is he generates a patch and attaches it to the end of the message. And then when this guy gets it, he, what he does is he takes the message, he checks the signature on the patch and decides whether or not he, he believes that that's correct, and then if so, he will apply the patch, and then he will potentially make his own patch if he needs to make changes to, to the, this. And so then when the, when the message gets received, essentially what happens is you have the message, but then you have all the different patches that came from the messages, and then you can, you can now have auditability to know who changed the message and in what way as it was being routed to the network. And so you can, you, you can uh, decide whether or not these signatures are for, for uh, exchange points that you actually legitimately trust, and um, if so, then you can apply the patches and interpret it from there. So, uh, I can't wait to see how this works in the real world, because this is, there's a lot of overhead for sending a fairly simple message uh, between carriers because of all of this. Um, the next thing is how key management is going to work. So. Every carrier needs to have its own encryption keys, uh, public and private key pairs, and every service that sits underneath it needs to have its own public and private key pairs, and uh, they all need to be trusted by everyone else. And there's a question about whether or not um, we need a central route of trust, essentially, for the whole 5G roaming interconnect network. The standards right now do not say that we need a single root of trust. Right now, they basically say that there's going to be cross signatures. So let's say this is AT&T and Verizon. So AT&T is going to generate a bunch of digital certificates and ask Verizon to sign them. And then therefore, Verizon will trust them. And then the flip side also happens. Verizon will gen a bunch, generate a bunch of digital certificates. AT&T will sign them. And then as a result, AT&T will trust the ones that they've signed. Um, this sounds like a scalability nightmare if every carrier has to cross-sign everyone's keys in order to be able to be trusted. Um, so we have actually, uh, as part of one of the projects I'm on, we have proposed that, at least in the U.S. and maybe globally, we try to stand up a, uh, a shared route of trust that could uh, sign everyone's keys. So uh, all the major, all 180 cell phone carriers in the world could get a digital certificate from a master route of trust. They could sign their own stuff. And then everybody would be able to have inferred trust through this trust hierarchy. Um, one of the things that's going to make this more likely to happen is uh, what's happening right now with robocalls. So um, I'm sure many of you get robocalls all the time. Uh, you're tired of getting phone calls from some random number that just so happens to have the same area code as your phone because they think that'll make you answer more likely to answer. Uh, robocalls are a huge problem nationally, and the FCC has gotten really uh, uh, is breathing down the necks of the carriers to come up with a solution to robocalls because everyone is so pissed off by them. <laughs> uh, yeah? Actually, speaking of robocalls, I have somebody who is actively using my number to ah, get hey, robocalls hey. to other people. Have you, have you heard of that? Oh, yeah. No, no. Yeah. So the problem with robocalls is that you can spoof caller ID. 
Caller ID is not authenticated. Anybody can no. send a phone. In fact, if you go deep in the phone in the menus of your phone, you can probably change the phone number that shows up in caller ID when you call someone else. Um, there's no authentication in caller ID. And so what's happening right now is there's a new standard, cleverly known as Stir Shaken, um, where they are looking at adding digital encryption uh, or digital signatures to caller ID records. So as your phone makes a call, once it hits the network, the network is going to verify that the phone number in it is correct. It's going to, to digitally sign that message. That's going to go through the network, and when it gets to the other side, that number is going to be validated. And then um, if you have a landline phone, I'm, I don't know, the one person in the room that has a landline phone, you could have like a different ringtone, like the phone might make a weird noise if you had a validated call coming in versus a non-validated call. Or the little, the little screen on your, I, again, cord, for those that have a cordless phone in your, I don't know, whatever. Who, I'm cu curious, who has a landline phone? Do any students have a landline phone? <laughs> the old guys do. All right, <laughs> okay. Uh, but for cell phones, basically, what would happen is when the when your when the phone rings, it would actually on the main ringing screen, it would show you an authenticated identity of who's calling you, and you could decide whether or not to answer. And then you could automatically start blocking people that were were not authentic or were spoofed. So the the, the goal is to get this deployed across the U.S. by by May. The FCC has a mandate out to try and get this. I think all deployed by May, and. The, the idea is that they're going to be building a digital signature ecosystem to support this, and the sort of same infrastructure they built for that could be leveraged to do all the 5G encryption certificates as well. Um, we don't have much time to go into all the rest of this, because I gave way too many fun anecdotal examples. Um, so we've only covered the bottom box uh, in, in uh, the sort of layers that I had wanted to talk about. Um, I guess I can give extremely superficial views. Network slicing, this whole idea of being able to support crazy use cases. Um, there's uh, this whole concept of software-defined networking and network function virtualization that is what's enabling all this, the, the ability to make everything virtualized. Um, there's all these different management functions. One of the core things is this uh, management and orchestration layer that's responsible for all the virtualized network functions. This is, this is the sort of future view of the world. You have hardware. Compute storage and networking. You have a virtualization layer. On top of that, you have virtual computing, virtual storage, and virtual networking. And on top of that, you can build any kind of virtualized network function that you want. And you can wire them together in any way that you want. And then there's this thing called management and network orchestration over here on the side that's responsible for deciding how to provision it all and how to lay it out and how to connect it. And um, none of the security for any of that's been sorted out. Uh, so, yeah. <laughs> yep. So you mentioned with the increased virtualization of basically everything on the internet and how this kind of seems like a radical change in general in the whole philosophy of everything, it's going to take physical hardware mm -hmm. out of the equation a lot. How do you think that's going to affect, like, if we take the cable out, we start taking the server racks out, how's that going to affect the active workforce of, like, the older people who aren't trained on, like, really? Well, you still need all the physical hardware. It, it, you still need all the physical hardware. It's just that physical hardware is not specific to a particular function anymore. Yeah. Now you just have blade servers that are just raw storage computer networking capabilities. Yeah. Um, so you still need all that. It's just that it now can be used for anything. It doesn't have to be a Cisco router anymore. You could turn it into a, I don't know, a, a video codec processing unit or something, right? It's all virtual. So um, it's going to create a lot more emphasis on the, the need for the software skills that sit on top of that hardware, though. Yeah, that's what I was saying, though. If somebody has a really strong hardware background, it might just create a threshold of, you know, Potentially. <laughs> so all the double E's in the room switch to computer engineering. <laughs> it's already happening. <laughs> already happening. Uh, there's a zillion different open source projects out that try to do different layers of this. They're all only, like, halfway done. There's, like, 25 PhD dissertations up here to try and figure out how any of these could actually work together and actually complete a bunch of half-finished open source projects and really build out all these different functions that would be needed to, to, to realize this. There's a lot of effort to try and figure out how to build open source versions of all of this 5G stuff. Um, and, and different universities, particularly in Europe, are, are starting to build pieces of it. But really interesting time to just jump in and start getting involved in all these open source programs. Uh, this is more management network organization. This is some examples around how you can actually push virtualized firewalls into different systems and uh, different examples. 
Uh, and then, of course, we've got edge computing. Edge computing is this idea that in, uh, everything's virtual, including all the computations. So um, I, can, I, can, I can push push processing to the edge. I can push processing to my actual device. Uh, it can happen wherever it needs to happen to meet different um, uh, latency requirements. Um, there's some interesting open source platforms for that. So over the summer, AT&T released a system called Acrano, uh, which is uh, now open source and is one of the first kind of real edge computing architectures where you could actually look at how you might have a, a, a cloud workload that could migrate to an edge service and, and be able to provide low latency communications. There's another system called EdgeX, uh, which is really focused on machine to machine communication for IoT applications. Again, this thing's like, 30% done. They've got a whole diagram of all the different parts they want to build, and there's a bunch of open source developers that are working on different parts of it. And the security for, if you look at, at, at EdgeX, there's this box that says security with a dotted line on it because nobody's thought about it or written that code yet. So, again, these are the things that, that frighten me as someone who's worried about the security of all this. Um, so, all right. Well, that's my last slide. A um, couple minutes for questions. Yes. Uh, so the DOD, of course, wants to now get into this 5G, wants to get the big 5G push. Uh -huh. get into it. What do you see uh, DOD's role? What do you think is going to happen? So um, a year ago, this guy in the National Security Council wrote a memo saying that uh, we should nationalize the 5G network here in the United States. And instead of it being run by AT&T and Verizon, the federal government should take over 5G. Because it's the only way we're going to be able to be, make it, be built secure. This memo got leaked. It got, this guy was like a one-star general. Got, got fired. I mean, he didn't get fired from the military. He got fired from the National Security Council. Um, but that was like the first glimmer that people were starting to worry about it. Um, over the last six months, it's been... Huawei and ZTE are trying to hack us all, and so we need to get ahead of this to prevent them from getting the market share to, uh, uh, to somehow be able to own a lot of our uh, network infrastructure. That was another topic I got to testify on Capitol Hill about, uh, uh, is, is the threat of supply chain. So uh, the DOD is very interested for two reasons. One, um, they want to trust the supply chain because they want the, they, they want the infrastructure of the United States to be secure. They want to be able to know that they can do command and control of nuclear weapons over our internet and know that it's going to be secure and know that there isn't someone who can prevent us from launching an uh, intercontinental ballistic missile if we have to. They want to make sure that the national leadership of the United States has the ability to have secure communications at all times. And that necessitates making sure that 5G and all the secondary effects of 5G are secure. Um, so what we're seeing right now from DOD is sort of two broad buckets emerge. One is efforts to really help invest in the US infrastructure, i.e. invest in universities to do research that's going to generate the patents that are going to be implemented for 6G, and then create the startup companies around the universities and the patents that are going to be the next Qualcomm and be the next Nokia and be the next uh, Lucent and be the next Motorola. Like, how do we invest in universities to create the innovation that will lead to the companies that will do all this? Uh, so that's one half of the initiative. The other half says, you know what? 5G is actually way better than anything DOD has right now, right? If you look at a tactical radio that a, a soldier has in the field, it's got dial-up speeds, right? <laughs> um, so what if we could start looking at 5G and 5G waveforms and 5G communications for Tactical networking for air-to-air -air communications, air-to-ground communications, SATCOM. There's all these SATCOM modes in here. It's way faster than any of the SATCOM stuff that the military has right now. And then as you start looking at, at edge computing and network slicing and so all this virtualization, I mean, the, the Pentagon just spent $10 billion on their Jedi <laughs> cloud, but they bought 10-year-old technology. So what is, all, what is network slicing and virtualization? What does all this mean for some, uh, an agency that just spent $10 billion buying the cloud? Um, so the other half is how do we, how does DOD take advantage of all this? And so there's going to be a lot of investments coming out of places like DARPA in, I don't know, tactical radio using 5G that then will turn into companies and university research that will then also contribute to that innovation pipeline that, that, that they aspire to achieve. 
So uh, there's 15 zillion different conversations happening right now. I know Jeff and I are talking to different parts of DOD right now on, in different meetings, and Jerry's involved in some of those conversations. And there's a lot of different players, all with similar visions. So hopefully that's a good thing, um, that, that it'll turn into something coherent. But um, the Pentagon has approved a major initiative. They just don't know what the major initiative is. Uh, I guess at this point. <laughs> you see the government getting more involved in standards. Standard. That was something that was directly recommended, is that NIST uh, used to be very engaged, and they, that engagement has dropped off considerably. And so I, don't, like, I put together one of the proposals was bouncing back and forth was just $20 million a year to go to NIST so that they can show up at standards meetings. Right. <laughs> so, um, yeah. All right, well, thank you very much.